Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Beyond the Firewall, Securing Patient, Staff, and the Healthcare Internet of Things. It's brought to you by Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. I'm Lori from HIS Talk and I'll be moderating. Our speaker today is Daniel Farlin. Daniel is Head of Network Solutions for Healthcare in the Network Business Division of Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. Daniel's responsible for developing, positioning, and communicating the value proposition of ALE solutions to internal and external clients, including industry analysts. He has worked in startups and small to large enterprise businesses in a variety of executive leadership roles. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Laurie, and thanks to everyone for attending today. So we're going to take um, a look at security in a more holistic approach. We know that the firewall is a good starting point, but beyond the firewall, what can happen? How do you secure your healthcare network, which is critical? So I'll introduce myself, the company. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some IT predictions in healthcare and some challenges. We'll look at uh, Alcatel Lucent Enterprises Digital Age Networking, which is our blueprint for healthcare. We'll talk about IoT onboarding, security and management, workflows, geolocation, and contact tracing, which is critical nowadays, and a few conclusions. Then, of course, open for Q&A. All right, so who are we? Uh, Alcatel Lucent Enterprise has been around for actually 101 years in different names. Um, we have roughly 2,200 employees worldwide. We service about 50 countries. We have 2,900 plus partners and over 830,000 customers. So our global headquarters are in Cologne, France, and our networking headquarters where I'm located are in Calabasas, California, which is Southern California. So let's get right into some of the predictions. Uh, this is from Frost and Sullivan and Market Watch. And keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic. So things have changed to some degree. Digital health. North America is quite advanced in digital health as far as e-records, as we're well sharing patient portals, information. Patients want to be more engaged, but this isn't true everywhere in the world. Uh, there are a lot of customers, a lot of healthcare providers and hospitals that still uh, enable records through written files. So this is an opportunity for transformation, digital transformation that they can go through. And uh, we, as well as others, can help them go through that. Then we talk about telehealth. We know that telehealth has exploded during the pandemic. Um, significant amount of visits, of um, conversations between patient and doctor have been done from the home to the doctor's office using either a mobile app or a web app or some type of electronic connectivity. And this is not going to abate. This will continue because people actually find convenience and the costs are frankly lower. So why not take advantage of that? Then we have M Health. Well, you know that Apple recently launched their watch. It monitors your uh, heart rate. Uh, you have other devices that are wearables, and they will be seen increasingly in use because uh, patients will be monitored from their home increasingly versus at a hospital, at a clinic, that sort of thing. So you're going to see more of these type of uh, technologies and really requests from patients because they feel more comfortable at home. And in fact, um, whatever you monitor from the home is more realistic versus going into an office feeling a little nervous, blood pressure goes up, that sort of thing. And then, of course, remote monitoring, I talked about that. There's number, a number of technologies you see ads today where you can monitor your blood glucose using an app. You could send that information up to the cloud to your doctor so they can monitor it. We're going to see a lot more of this going on. So the key is there's a definite trend towards digitalization as far as use cases and apps, but how does a hospital, clinic, assisted living facility support these technologies and demands? So we know that uh, IoT in hospitals has different types of equipment. You can see from uh, the images here, you have robotic surgery, you have uh, robotic dispensing of prescription drugs, you have heart rate monitors, sensors, infusion pumps, MRIs, the gamut. Everything is getting connected, whether it's wired or wireless. What we don't think of 
is the other aspect of connectivity in a hospital. You still have heating and ventilation and air conditioning. You still have security and sprinkler systems. All of these are getting connected to the same infrastructure increasingly. You can't support multiple networks um, effectively from a cost perspective. You really have to leverage an infrastructure, but how do you do that securely? Right? That's where we can come in. So I found this interesting, uh, doing some research that imaging systems and patient monitors were the two types of systems that were hacked the most in a hospital. But what's interesting about this slide is that the hackers were inside the hospital, not outside the hospital. So you normally think of the, ha the hacker, the cloak, being in the dark room on the outside, trying to break in through the firewall. This is someone in your waiting room. This is a patient's friend who's actually secretly trying to hack into your network. And this has some real ramifications and impacts because patients can get affected in serious ways. So this is something to keep in mind. So what are some of the challenges? For one, it's connecting all of these millions, billions of devices. Granted, a hospital may only have thousands, but how do you manage those? How do you securely connect them? And how do you monitor to make sure that their behavior is what is expected? Then, of course, you have people, you have the clinicians, you have nurses, you have staff, security, patients, and visitors. Each one has different requirements in a hospital. The visitor, the patient, well, the visitor may get internet access. The patient may get internet access in some streaming video capabilities. Of course, the clinicians need access to the various uh, electronic records, imaging systems from MRI and x-rays, that sort of thing. So each has different requirements. And then, of course, it's the ability to create a process and then to optimize that process in as simple way as possible. So what ALE has done, we've looked at all of these. We've worked with a number of hospital clients uh, around the world and business partners as well as analysts. And we've come up with what we have as a blueprint for healthcare. It's called the Digital Age Networking, or DAN. And that consists of three key pillars. One is the autonomous network, which allows you to automate mission critical network operations, ultimately to improve the user experience. And that's the clinician, the patient, the visitor, et cetera. Second is IoT. You have to be able to scale up your digitalization so that you can securely connect IoT, onboard and manage them, as well as monitor. And the third aspect is business innovation. So this is the ability to accelerate your transformation with new automated workflows. We have workflows. We know how things work. With the technology available today, you'll be able to actually better understand if you are optimizing your workflows, whether it's uh, the patient care pathway or whether it's how you uh, maintain equipment, like infusion pumps, that sort of thing. <clears throat> All right, so part of this... Uh, uh, digital age networking includes the autonomous network and what that is uh, the ability for the network to self-configure zero touch configuration we call it so for one you uh, set up parameters within your infrastructure the network begins to build itself out then as you connect devices they self-attach so you define in your parameters where you want devices to be connected to and this infrastructure does that this also allows simple moves, as and changes because the network is intelligent enough to understand what the primary configuration and goals of your architecture are. And therefore, if you remove a device or add a device, it will automatically be uh, employed into that architecture. And the technology we use is all industry standard. So we use multiple connections using something called uh, SPB. Shortest path bridging, it's an industry standard protocol. I don't want to get into the technical aspects, of course, but uh, what that does is allow every connection to be functional and operational in real time. Should a device go down, the network knows and automatically reroutes because everything has been connected initially anyway. When that device has been either taken out of service or replaced, repaired, then you get automatic service creation. And what does this do? This entire blueprint of the infrastructure allows you to uh, ensure that your operations, your applications continuously operate. That's the goal here, right? You want 24-7 uptime. 
for your critical and even non-critical uh, resources. Second pillar is IoT. For one, you need to know what, your, what is being connected to your network. Is it okay to be connected to your network? So we have a database of more than 29 million devices in the cloud that we access to make sure that we know what type of device is being connected to your network. Once you've discovered and classified it, you need to virtually segment it. Now, I previously talked about the different types of devices that can connect to an infrastructure, and it's really not feasible to manage multiple networks. So what our blueprint proposes is a single network infrastructure with multiple virtual network segments built into it. And this representation is an example of a virtual segment where you may have your uh, security cameras and your door lock systems in one virtual segment. You may have your HVAC alarm systems in another, and you may have patient monitoring equipment in another. So if by chance a hacker enters through a device into the network, they cannot get into the others because they are virtually separated as if they didn't exist. So well enough that things are securely connected, um, they're virtually segmented, but now you need to continuously monitor. What if you have a security camera that sends you an image every second, and then all of a sudden you get a burst of one meg of data? That could be a denial of service attack. It could also be a simple issue. If you have a wireless camera and someone thinks it's an access point, they're attempting to connect to it, but they never can, you can actually go investigate. But the network is smart enough that it will temporarily take that device offline while you investigate. So that's the beauty of continuously monitoring and the automation built in to the network. So we've talked about the firewall, that's great. We've talked about identifying IoT, onboarding its security, uh, securely monitoring it and managing it. What about the actual elements within the network infrastructure, your access points, your switches, routers, that sort of thing? So uh, what we do is we have something called security diversified code. All of our switches go through third-party independent validation and verification to make sure there's no backdoors, holes that a hacker could potentially enter. If anything is found, we fix the software and then get it retested. If it's good, then that's what becomes the operating system on our switches. So we're able to secure the operating system from within. Then we have some other built-in capabilities like uh, denial of service attack prevention. So if the CPU or the main brains of the switch detects patterns that aren't typical or usual behavior, it will actually block that traffic while you investigate. And of course, we get all the certifications that are necessary. In fact, we sell to Department of Defense, so we need the highest levels of security. Uh, we have the ability to fingerprint devices. I talked about that, different ways of securely connecting them. Uh, we also identify user profiles. So what that means is if you're a clinician, uh, you will have access, for example, to the patient record, to the surgery robot. You don't want the nurse to have access to the surgery robot or a visitor. So how do you make sure that they don't? You set up specific policies that enable um, applications to be used only by those that are authorized to use them. And this is how you can break it out into groups, so all nurses, or all clinicians or specific individuals, it's up to you to figure out how you want to slice it and dice it. Applications and analytics. We actually look at the applications at the edge of the network. So every one of our switches, every one of our access points will look at an application before it enters the network. There are other solutions out there. They use an appliance within the network. That means the application already entered your network. So there's a risk right there. In our case, if it's suspicious, it won't be allowed in. Plus you have analytics at the edge. You want to know what's going on with your IoT devices. I talked about the behaviors previously. The analytics is a way to know what's going on, as well as the typical network analytics where you see number of users, number of bandwidth that's being used, et cetera. And then the IoT containment piece, that's where you virtually segment the network. Uh, so when you combine all of these, it gives you really a uh, secure 360 degree approach end to end from the core to the edge because our infrastructure goes from edge, aggregation, core. So basically the whole infrastructure. All right, and then the third pillar is business innovation. 
that's really for process creation. And we have an engine for that. It's called Rainbow Workflow. So you look at IoT, you look at the infrastructure, the applications you want to use, and then the people, so the policies. Is it a clinician, a visitor, a patient? Is it a nurse? Is it security, etc.? Once you know all those elements, you put certain conditions together and the Rainbow Workflow Engine will deliver a specified outcome. Here's an example. You can set up a certain amount of triggers. So whether you have a sensor or a, an active button, a security camera that's catching something and you want to monitor that, you set up certain rules. Once you have a trigger and it meets a certain rule, an action occurs. And that action could take the form of a single or multiple different initiatives. One is contacting uh, first responders. Another is just setting off an alarm. One is setting up a communication uh, bubble, as we call it, with our Rainbow product, which is basically a group chat, notifications, that sort of thing. Just to clarify this point, here's an example. So you may have a refrigeration system that um, is set to a certain temperature, or maybe it's just a cooling environment. So in this case, it shows you temperature is 21.74 degrees. So you set a trigger, let's say for 21 degrees, if that piece of equipment hits 21 degrees, send an, a notification which invites people through their mobile app to uh, initiate a collaboration session. So the collaboration session calls you, it's a chatbot essentially, and then the people that you've predefined will get that notification and now you can see all the messages and take remedial action immediately. So this is one example. You could have this in a refrigeration unit with prescription drugs. What if that refrigeration unit goes down for some reason? Uh, you would get a notification that would allow you to act quickly so that you don't have to throw out those very expensive uh, prescription drugs. This is a simple example. Okay, then of course, we have technologies, location services. So location services are important to locate people and equipment. For one, it allows you to find medical equipment quickly. Um, nurses spend more than one hour per shift, on average, looking for people or things. This would reduce that time dramatically. You could also create virtual zones. So if you want a certain piece of equipment in a certain zone, whether it's a ward, a department, a floor, and that piece of equipment is taken out of there, a notification would be sent right away. This example, the heart rate monitor was taken out of its designated area. So you want to know that. Another example is to quarantine people. So you could set up different virtual zones. Each color here is a different zone. Uh, and if somebody goes beyond a certain zone that they shouldn't, you get a notification. Um, in this case, it's make sure you sanitize your hands before you go in or out of a room. And uh, another example is sending out a mass notification in case uh, of an emergency situation, whatever that may be, where everyone would get that notification and be able to quickly go to the designated exit. All right, so quarantine management could be using a variety of uh, what we call asset tags. And the technology we use is Bluetooth Low Energy because it has very low battery consumption. And also uh, Bluetooth Low Energy um, has a, a near field signal strength. So you get better accuracy real time on a floor plan map. That's why we've chosen BLE, although there are other solutions as well. Uh, this, so this is one example where you have a patient leaving a quarantine zone using Rainbow Workflow in this case. The trigger is that someone went beyond a zone and the action alerts security doctors, nurses, and hospital directors. Let's say this patient uh, had COVID, but they're in the early stage, so they're still mobile. They shouldn't be moving around, yet for some reason they did. You would get these sets of notifications and you can quickly act. Now, something that's uh, becoming more prevalent for return to work, return to school, just plain uh, healthcare safety, is the ability to do some hotspot tracking and contact tracing. With hotspot tracking, you have the ability to set up virtual boundaries again. You can check density of people in real time. You can also see who's in certain areas as uh, per the hotspot diagram. So that could be 
emergency waiting area? Why do you have so many people in that area? Maybe you need more staff. Uh, or this could be a, a group of uh, individuals, say, in a, a cafeteria. You want to keep the social distance in place, yet you can see that the density is very high. So maybe you send someone to the cafeteria to make sure that people are maintaining their separation, physical separation. Then, of course, you can have geo notifications. That's a notification based on the actual location to know who's entered and who's left an area. And I'll show you an example of a report that uh, we can generate. From a contact tracing perspective, you want to know how long people were in specific areas on a floor plan map, who entered and exited those areas, and who was close to each other, because that's the whole purpose of contact tracing, right? Were they close to each other enough where they may have uh, been affected by someone that was uh, COVID-19 positive. And then you can print a report, a 14-day report. Here's an example where you can see that Dr. Johnson entered room 101 at uh, 8, 10 a.m. on February the 12th. And uh, subsequent to that, patient entered the room and a patient exited the room and then the doctor exited. So this is giving you kind of a time stamp of activities. And you can get as granular as you choose. Um, you can select a number for a patient so they're anonymous and match it in a database. This is completely under your control. Uh, however, it does give you the ability to do some contact tracing. So we've worked with uh, a firm called uh, Institut Mean Telecom. They're in France. Uh, and what they do is develop AI models of hospitals. So uh, we worked together with them. They took our asset tracking solution and were able to develop this video, which uh, the context would be, for example, let's look at an existing hospital. What would it look like in the case of an emergency whereby we become uh, over, over flooded, if you will, with uh, patients? So how can we handle that? What they've done is they've set up the model to show how things work today, and then they can do what-if scenarios. And you can see them visually and then adjust those workflows. That's what I was referring to earlier. You can optimize those workflows based on these AI models. And also, if you're building a new hospital or clinic, you can also look at different designs and see what could work better for you and your requirements. Okay. so. How do you make all of this work, right? It sounds pretty complicated. There's a lot of different solutions and use cases. The good thing is we deliver this through a single management platform, whether on premise or in the cloud. That platform enables you to view the entire network, look at your floor plans, look at how you've uh, virtually segmented your infrastructure, look at the applications at the edge, um, that sort of thing. So you have all the reporting that you need, as well as just the health of your um, network itself and how it's performing. Then we layer on top of that our edge to core security, including the operating system. When you offer geolocation as well as a context, now you can set up a user, a device, location and application profile, develop a policy. These are the policies I was referring to earlier. And these policies follow you wherever you go, whether you're wired or wirelessly connected. Once it knows who you are, the device you're using, so it could be a laptop plugged into a LAN port, and then you disconnect it and walk around connected to wireless. You don't have to reconnect. It knows who you are and uh, where you are. And basically, you can set up a policy that says, uh, I'm a visitor. Therefore, a visitor will get internet access only in the waiting room, uh, and that's it. You have a patient that may get internet access in their patient room, or uh, when they see people in the hallways, that sort of thing. Uh, you also have the option to um, differentiate groups or individuals as well. Okay, so if we look at the 360 degree approach, we talked about the hardened operating system, the secure onboarding, the automation that we can offer with Rainbow Workflow, 
And then you can improve your priority management for crisis situations with the triggers, the rules, and the outcomes, and then the location intelligence. So once you combine these entirely, you can see how security is beyond the firewall. So ALE has uh, hospital, healthcare, assisted living facility customers around the world. We work with them intimately to understand what their requirements are. In the US, Advocate Aurora Healthcare is our largest customer, and they're, I believe, the number 10 size uh, healthcare provider in the US. Um, so we work with them closely to understand what their requirements are. We develop use cases based on their requirements, as well as looking at the market analysts. We talk to them regularly, and our business partners. We want to know, um, you know what they're seeing out there. So together, we've spent at least a decade working uh, and delivering solutions for healthcare providers around the world. Just emphasizing some of our US customers. <clears throat> okay, and that's the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, Lori, if you have any questions, I'll entertain them at this time. Thank you, Daniel. Um, as a reminder to the audience, you use the um, console the GoToWebinar console to submit your questions. Our first question, how many of your healthcare customers are currently planning to go through their digital transformation to support telehealth and digital health? Okay, good question. So we have a number of customers that already are using our solutions for telehealth. Um, a number of them like um, Aurora Healthcare, uh, Advocate Aurora Healthcare, they already have gone through the digital transformation. They were one of the first to go through uh, the ability to onboard IoT devices, um, and they have these telehealth solutions in place. Um, we have different telehealth solutions. We have uh, remote access points, as we call them, wraps, where you would put them in a clinic or potentially in a home. Uh, we also have a collaboration app called Rainbow. So it's a workflow engine, but also a collaboration app similar to WhatsApp, except it's designed for business, enterprise, healthcare. Uh, we're going through HIPAA certification for it. It's certified in Europe now, um, and that is secure. So we do have customers that already have gone through digital transformation. We also have customers that have separate phone networks and data networks believe it or not, uh, in the Middle East. So some are extremely advanced in the Middle East, others are still using paper files and have separate networks. So we've been working with them to help them through their digital transformation. And of course, COVID has both accelerated and slowed this whole process down because uh, COVID ha has been one of the triggers to get things moving. On the other hand, it's difficult to get moving when you're quarantined. So uh, we already know the work ahead for us to help them through their digital transformation, and that's going to be happening as uh, countries start to open up. Thank you. Um, the next question, have any of your customers expressed concerns about cyber or user security? Uh, all of them. <laughs> so all the customers we talk about uh, have issues or potential issues, right? Uh, we don't know of any customer of ours um, that has been hacked, at least they haven't mentioned it to us, uh, but the topic of cybersecurity is top of mind. In fact, uh, just connecting IoT is a concern for many of them, let alone some of these other technologies, right? Letting uh, visitors come in and connect to the Wi-Fi network. So cybersecurity is top of mind, uh, and increasingly, unfortunately, due to COVID as well, because hospitals have been opening up their uh, lines to telehealth. Uh, there, all, there have been hackers that have been taking advantage of that as well. So uh, cybersecurity is increasing. We know there are uh, more hacks than before, ransomware attacks, that sort of thing. And what we're here to do is help them understand how we're trying to protect not only their infrastructure, but also the products that they put in that creates the solutions and the infrastructure to help support their use cases. Great. Um, the next question, are any of your healthcare customers talking about contact tracing solutions? Yes, so what's interesting is um, in healthcare, you know, they've dealt with this pandemic over the last what, nine, 10 months. Um, and 
you know, there are heroes, right? However, what I'm finding is in healthcare, um, they're focusing more on, w w rightfully so, to deal with the pandemic right now. We're getting more requests for asset tracking, contact tracing, to get schools back. In the US, as in a number of countries, uh, kids are learning remotely. That's not the ideal scenario. They're trying to get the kids, the teachers, back onto the school campus live. So to do that, they also want to safeguard not only schools, you have business, right? Business wants to get employees. Um, in some companies, they have to work at physical location and they want to get customers in safely. So I'm hearing more from other vertical industries, which we support five, by the way, now, healthcare, education, transportation, hospitality, and government. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of requests from those areas. In healthcare, contact tracing is not a new thing. Um, or I should say asset tracking is not a new thing. Contact tracing is, but they're exploring different options. So there's uh, mobile app type contact tracing solutions, but everyone has to use a mobile app. Our solution uses asset tags. So basically, you could give a visitor, a patient, a nurse, a clip-on or a tag on a lanyard. Right? Nurses and doctors already clip-on badges. We have badge uh, tags as well. So we're trying to make it as easy for the industry to uh, adopt as possible. But in healthcare, I'm not hearing as much as in other verticals to answer the question. All right, thank you. Um, the next question, do you know if any of your customers have an asset tracking solution already installed? Yes, so some already use asset tracking solutions um, and they're typically older technology. So it's Wi-Fi based. Uh, Wi-Fi is okay. It's not as accurate as Bluetooth low energy. These Wi-Fi solutions actually use another uh, technology in patient rooms. So they'll use either um, infrared technology to get in-room accuracy or other vendors will use um, sonic technology, ultrasound technology. So now you're taking Wi-Fi and ultrasound, Wi-Fi and infrared. You have to have tags that support both. It gets very complex and expensive. Our solution is a simple matter of a BLE gateway. Our access points, in fact, also support BLE, so you can use those as gateways. And they monitor the real time location of these asset tags. Uh, there are some solutions also that are not real time. Ours is about two seconds uh, of updates. Some vendors have one minute plus of updates. And for contact tracing, that's really not appropriate. You need something that's more close to real time. And so um, that's the difference between what's out there today and what will come. And typically, these asset tracking solutions that are in place have been there for a number of years, and the hospitals are now looking for a refresh. Um, so that would be an opportunity for us to uh, demonstrate our capabilities. Okay, um, the next question. Are any of your customers looking for a wireless LAN refresh to Wi-Fi 6? Oh, yes. Uh, we've had a huge year, uh, even though we've had a pandemic. We've had a lot of demand for Wi-Fi 6. So any wireless or Wi-Fi wireless LAN request uh, is associated with Wi-Fi 6. In most cases, not every. We're finding that uh, in South American countries, um, they're still happy with Wi-Fi 5, uh, which is great, AC Wave 2 basically. Uh, but in North America, Europe, even Asia Pacific regions, they're looking to Wi-Fi 6 because that's the next technology it's backwards compatible um, and it also fights some of the arguments against 5g which is still building out so it's very high performance and allows many more users to connect which is ideal for healthcare okay um that was our last question daniel so um we'll conclude our webinar I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you, Daniel, for an interesting and informative presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.